Bible for you to loan. It's a good one and um, if you got good eyes because the print's a little fine and the um, we have the page numbers for the scriptures for you so you can help you there. <clears throat> when we uh, when we read the scriptures, we find out some uh, wonderful things about us that uh, God has done in his grace, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That means well, if God is not broke, neither are we. Uh, but God's speaking about uh, our spiritual condition and about our eternity. Uh, when we read about um, the saints in the Bible, especially in the church, uh, we find that many of them were, um, were, were, they were far from rich, I must say. Um, they didn't have a big emphasis on wealth. They had a job to do for the Lord and they were very busy with that. Uh, we know that some people today stand in a pulpit and they tell you that God wants you uh, rich that Jesus Christ became poor so that you might become rich and they understand that in a material sense and so the the test of God's blessings in your life has to do with money and I want you to know that that is not the test of God's love for you the demonstration of God's love for you is Calvary and your future in him is beyond what we can imagine uh, today, God does not want us to trust in uncertain riches. And so there are many of us he doesn't give a lot of it to. But there are other factors involved in why somebody has and somebody doesn't have. And it's a, it's a wrong oversimplification to say that person has because God blessed them. That person does not have because God didn't bless them. Uh, most of the time we're not in a position to be that judge of that situation but we're, we don't we don't want to spend a, 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 an inordinate amount of time on on ungodly mammon as scripture might teach uh, or as we've mentioned before a filthy lucre uh, <laughs> the Bible speaks a great deal about finances and we've already talked about the fact that God is the owner of everything that makes us stewards of it. and so we are to handle whatever we have to Lord God we're to use it for his glory now God has given us more than we need hasn't he I mean almost all of us have much more than we actually need and uh, and we should not find our treasure in the things that we possess because Jesus said that's not the measure of a person's life it's not the measure of your life it's not the uh, it's not your identity it's not your worth your worth is found in your relationship with God and Jesus Christ and with the Apostle Paul we should learn to be content in whatever state we're in whether we are happen to be abounding at the moment or whether we are being abased that does not change our relationship with Christ. But your dealing with materials and money on this earth, God has given you guidance on it because it's a very important thing. It reflects a lot in our relationship with God and what's important to us, but it also is a testimony to the world around us. And so we need to see it in that way. So we're going to go through... Uh, uh, some scriptures here and I'm going to go kind of fast after I keep throwing trash on the ground here but anyway uh, go if you would to the book of Proverbs in uh, chapter 28 and I want to just look at these these verses for a principle that we will move on from today the subject matter is that wealth is the reward of labor. Okay? In your mind, I want you to connect in this life 
I don't want you to ever disconnect. But money is the result of labor. Wealth is the result of work. That's the principle that God lays down in his word for us about this. Now, some of you know this very well. Some of you work, 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 okay? Um, we, we just need to be careful that we're working for the right things, okay? Um, we should not be a slave to things having to... If, if things that we have or the things that we possess, if they require so much work that we cannot do what we think God wants us to do, then we need to reevaluate our lives. I mean, your, your eternity, I'm not talking whether you go to heaven or hell or not, I'm talking about your eternity. When you stand before God as a believer with eternal life and forgiveness, your eternity is not worth the things of this life. And, and that's one thing we need to do. But in this life, money does not grow on trees. It doesn't fall out of heaven. And, uh, and we should not expect God to use the lottery to meet our wishes. Okay? The reward of, la of, of labor is wealth. The Bible says a faithful man... This is somebody who is taking care of business, will abound with blessing, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. The one who is hastening to be rich is the one who's trying to take a shortcut. Now I'm not saying there is, there's hard work and there's, there's hard work that's smart and there's hard work that's not as smart. There, there are, we, we have to have some wisdom here. But there is no shortcut in God's plan. He does not want us to take some shortcut to wealth and prosperity and success. He wants us to take it one step at a time, learn the lessons along the way, and earn what we have and what we possess. Uh, a man with an evil eye hastens after riches. That's, we talked about last time, that's not the treasure that we are living for. Our treasure is our relationship with God in Christ Jesus. He, and, and this man does not consider that poverty will come upon him. That's the, the, the wisdom of Proverbs. Jesus said it also when he said, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. You see this principle? You know, um, my wife has tried to teach me this. I've learned it a little bit from her. But uh, some people will never get their finances in order because they don't understand the values of the pennies and the nickels and the dimes and the quarters. They only think the tens and the twenties and the hundreds have value. But God's principle is it starts with the little stuff. And if we wander the little stuff well then that's just going to be reflected in the big stuff and uh, so you know sometimes we can really be wasteful with what we think is not important when Jesus said everything is important those little things are important too um, when God made us talk to the kids about this I mean he didn't design us Adam did not sit by the stream and uh, his wife peeled grapes for him and he rested the whole time that's not God labored for six days to make the earth and he rested on the seventh that's a principle that God gave to mankind and uh, and Adam had a job to do Adam tend the garden and keep it now Hopefully it was cooler and less humid than it is now. I mean, my goodness, can you imagine? That would have been hard work. I mean, my wife loves to get outside, and sometimes she thinks I should be out there with her working in the yard. I like to work in the yard too. But in this heat, it's tough, isn't it? Okay? But the point is that God didn't, 
didn't just have Adam lay around. He gave him something to do. We don't know all about heaven. There's a lot of things we don't know about heaven. But I am really certain of this, that we're not going to sit around in heaven. We're, we're not going to sit around. God is going to have, that's the way God is. He knows that it's important to us. It gives us a sense of worth and accomplishment. We, we, we need that. And God will have something valuable for us to do for eternity. And we'll, get, we'll be so blessed by doing it. We really will. An example of this is a person like Isaac. You know. These guys, we say they got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These guys got rich. These guys worked hard. Okay. It, working hard is not a guarantee that you're going to be rich. Okay, some of you know that. But uh, being lazy is probably a guarantee that you won't. <laughs> Isaac sowed in the land. And, uh, and, and he, he worked hard. That sowing is uh, the, the curse by the sweat of your brow, he said. And so he, he, he planted. You can't reap a harvest if you don't plant. You know, that... that some people uh, are waiting for their ship to come in, but they've not even sent out a lifeboat. They haven't done anything in order to, to bring about that, that ship coming in, so to speak. Verse 12 says, Then Isaac sowed in the land, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. So don't, don't discount this, that God is involved in it. But God is blessing his labor it doesn't say that he sat in his tent and then he went out and there was a hundredfold in the, in the field. And it's not going to be that way in your life or my life either. For he had possessions and flocks and possessions of herd in great number. Um, but anyway, the, the, Lord, the man began to prosper and he continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Now that's not the goal of your life. It should not be the goal of your life. The goal of your life should be to honor Christ. But, but the connection in the Bible is, is that the things we need and the blessings and even the abundance, it comes from labor. God blessed labor. And uh, Isaac is an example of that. Uh, even to the children of Israel, what did he tell them? Six days you shall labor and do all your work. He said, well, this is about the Sabbath in Israel. I know it is. But, but this is... Part of it, we always say, don't work on the Sabbath. That's what you hear. Don't work on the Sabbath. Israel was not to work on the Sabbath. But, but he did say, work six days. So do your work. And uh, work is, is a gift from God. And that's what God blesses. You know, uh, we cannot allow ourselves to buy into any of the philosophies of the world that wealth comes from chance or from gambling or from illegal stuff. I mean, that's, that's, no, God says it's important we embrace this truth in our lives. And we will be a more effective witness for Christ in this world. Jeremiah said, the shepherds have become dull-hearted. They have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Without Christ being first in your life, you will not have your priorities in order. And you won't make wise decisions concerning your business. And these shepherds, they are examples of that. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness. You know, uh, Lisa was watching a documentary on um, one of the cartel leaders from Colombia. I mean, the guy got really, really rich. I think he's dead now. I don't think he took any of it with him. And, uh, and I think he heard a lot of people getting from there, from wherever he started to, to being so rich. God says, woe to him. You know, God's the one on the throne. His chambers builds his house by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. You see, this principle not only involves me. I cannot get 
I cannot get ahead. I can't even take care of things unless I work. But God won't bless that labor if I'm taking advantage of other people. This principle applies to me. I want to work and I want to see reward for my labor. If somebody does work for me, I want them to receive reward for their labor. We, we have to embrace that. This is uh, James is, 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 um, is, is interesting on this, this subject here. James seems to really have a, a bad attitude toward rich people. And, uh, and we have to put it in the setting. James is, um, he's in, in Jerusalem, the, the, uh, the, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, uh, they, were, they were the ones getting wealthy. Um, they, they, and it wasn't right. And then they were taking, taking advantage of poorer people. And so in, in chapter 5, verse 1, um, you know, wealth is supposed to be the reward of labor. And these are people who are wealthy and they didn't do that. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eating, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last day. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, harvest your fields, who you, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So James is saying to these who have taken advantage of people, use their hard work and not rewarded them for it, but they have taken advantage of them. God says God is not going to God is not going to forget that. You you have an accounting, and uh, and and God. Is not happy with that. Now we're going to march through the book of Proverbs in just a few minutes. We're going to run through the book of Proverbs here. And um, so we, we started, uh, we're going to start in chapter 6. We saw one of the verses from chapter 6 with the children. Go to the ant, you lazy guy. But uh, chapter 6, verse 9 And it says, how long will you slumber, O sluggard? That's the lazy man. Will you rise from your sleep, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep? So your poverty shall come upon you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. You know, the law of the harvest, you reap what you're sowing. The, the lazy man, is re, he is sowing. You say, well, he's not doing anything. He is sowing and he's going to reap poverty by doing nothing, not working hard, not doing a good job. In chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, He who has a slack hand, who is careless, lazy, becomes poor. But the hand of the diligent, the hardworking, the careful, makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. That's looking ahead, isn't it? It's going to be winter, there's not any harvest. But he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Oh, well. He can go to his neighbor's house that works hard, and he can maybe get a meal there. We're going to look at that. Proverbs 10:16: The labor of the righteous leads to life, the labor of the wicked to sin. And so there is a, a law of harvest. There is wages. And hard, honest work gets blessed. The wicked man, Proverbs 11:18, does deceptive work. You know, I get so discouraged in our culture today. You know, we have a, a huge bureaucracy in this state because of dishonest workers. It's become an excuse for our government to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're going to give you a license for this and a license for that and a permit for this and a permit for that. Because we're going to protect you from a deceptive worker. And, and what would be the need of any of that if we all worked hard and did the right thing? He who sows righteousness will have a sure reward. 
Uh, Proverbs 12, 24, the hand of the diligent will rule. The man who works hard and works wisely will see promotion. He, he will see blessing. But the lazy man will be... You see, one becomes a ruler, the hard worker. The lazy man becomes a slave. That's the choice there. The soul of the lazy man desires and has nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Principle. Proverbs 13, 11, Wealth gained by dishonesty will be dis diminished. It won't last. It's like having that, that money bag with holes in it. But he who gathers by labor will increase. You know, that's not always fast, is it? You know, um, we've seen... We've seen prosperity in this country. We've seen people, by the time they get old enough, they retire and they have plenty. You know, we might not ever see that again in this country. That, that might be a thing of the past. Each generation, the way we're headed, will become less and less able to retire. And, um, and it's because of how we're handling the money in our country. From the the citizen on the street to the person in the White House, all the way here to there, we're not following God's principles on finance, and we will suffer for it. Proverbs 14:23, "In all labor, there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Proverbs 16:11, "Honest weights and scales are the Lord, His weights are. The, all the weights in the bag are his work. And so this is, this is, let's make sure we understand. God talks about hard work, but he talks about honest work. You know, um, not ripping off people, not taking advantage of people. God will not bless that. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. Have patience. You know, um, we have a generation uh, that wants what their parents had, but they, their parents took 40 years to get it. They want it right away. That, that, but see, we have a method of getting it. We can borrow to get it. We can use credit to get it. And that is not, <laughs> that is not God's principle here. Work and plan, and, and, and be faithful, and God will bless. Proverbs 21, 6, Getting treasure by a lying tongue is the fleeting fantasy of those who seek death. Work hard and honest for it. Proverbs 22, 29, Do you see a man who excels in his work? He shall stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. You do your best. You work hard and do your best. And, and the, the, what do they say? The cream rise to the top. That's what God's paying. Proverbs 27, 23 to 24. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks. It got kind of, <clears throat> it got Joseph in trouble. His dad said, go check out the flocks. <laughs> he ended up a slave in Egypt. But that was part of God's plan there. Uh, attend to your herds. Don't neglect them. You know, I feel, I've, I feel a pang of, uh, of guilt about this. When I think about my, my home, there's some projects around. There's some, uh, there, there's some uh, woodwork. There's some uh, stuff that I need to attend to. And the longer I let it go, then the worse it's going to get. And uh, I need to attend to the state of my flocks. You have an area? That's what God said. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. Warning, warning, warning. Riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. Next book, Ecclesiastes, two little verses. You know, um, don't take this principle and become independent of anybody else. You know, we can do that. We can uh, become an island. So I can do this. I don't need anybody else. That's not God's wisdom. Work hard. But work in connection with people, build relationships, 
Get your family, get your kids involved. You know, the, one of the, there's some things that I would, uh, I would desire for all three of my children I would, that I pray for constantly. But one thing that I'm very grateful for with my kids, that all three of my kids have a good work ethic. That they don't expect handouts. They expect to work hard and do a good job and receive blessing from that. And, and I, I thank God for that. I really do. We need to pass that on. We need to encourage one another. We need to help one another. Um, I, I'm really blessed by seeing uh, Brother Orville and Corey, how they, they, they don't let the teenagers sit around very much. They call them up and said, come over, we got a project to do. You know, you can't stay in bed all morning. Come on, we're going to fix the basketball court or we're going to build a, 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 a horseshoe pit. We're going to do something like that. And that's, that is really great. That's really great. Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. This is about working hard, but working smart. Okay? Uh, God doesn't expect you to work hard and be stupid. He says, work, work hard, but, but be wise. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. You know, chop down a tree with a dull axe. That means there's some dullness up here, doesn't it? Spend the time to sharpen the axe, and then the tree will come down a lot better, won't it? Okay. All right, now we're going to go into the New Testament. We're going to talk about some of these principles for us today. And... Um, and so turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. And uh, it, uh, I've used a lot of Old Testament passages. And uh, we know that, that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles and to him is given the revelation of the mystery or the church at this age. So how, who are we and how do we uh, live before God today? The Pauline epistles become a lens by which we view the whole Bible and, and we judge what is that for me to learn, all of it, but what is that for me to apply? Some of it I cannot apply it in my own life. And so in uh, chapter 5, in uh, in verse 18, the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. So Paul quotes from the Old Testament, from the, from the Pentateuch, and he, he tells Timothy that this is a principle that is what we call trans-dispensational. I mean, it runs from cover to cover. On this world, in this life, this, this is something that God intends that it always operates while we are in this body. You shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the grain. You let that guy who's doing all the work, let him reap from the benefits from some of that. He's doing the work, let him reach down and grab a little grain to get the energy to keep working. That's what it says. And uh, Paul quotes Luke here. And he says, the laborer is worthy of his wages. It's something that if he did the work, he deserves the blessing from it, the wages from it. And so we, we need to understand that principle. We need to embrace that principle. It is a godly principle, and Christians should demonstrate that to this world. The world, our culture around us, is trashing this whole concept and our whole culture is reaping the consequences from it. Do you think we can live in this culture and be a, exempt from it? We could talk more about debt, but I mean, who knows how? I mean, we can't even fathom how deep our country is in debt. And, um, well, maybe our great-great-grandchildren can get out of it for us. I don't know, but that's not a godly principle. Look at, we're going to go to first. Thessalonians, and uh, if you were in Timothy, you need to go back to your left. <clears throat> now, 
The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, and, and, and Paul tells us that he is a pattern. He is a pattern. He is example for the believer of this age. Okay? And this is one thing that Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, and we need to learn from this. Chapter 2, verse 9. You remember, brethren, our labor and toil. We worked hard. We worked our tails off while we were in Thessalonica. He said, we labored night and day. You know, we're praying for a young lady who's trying to get settled in here, and she was here Wednesday night, and she found a job, and she's working this job. It's not enough to support her family. You know what she did? She went out and got a second job. You know, I, I know people won't do that. Why? I need my rest. I need my beauty sleep. I mean, if one job doesn't make ends meet, and you got some time, well, go get another one, if God will grant it. And then maybe he'll bring you into that one, but God will bless your labor. And so work, work hard. Paul says, I labored night and day so that we might not be a burden to any of you. Here's an example, okay? If it's within your power, don't be a burden to anybody. Don't make somebody work hard to carry your load if you can carry it yourself. That's what God says. That's the example from Paul. If you can carry it yourself. Sometimes we can't carry. And that's why God gave us family. That's why he gave us community. But we shouldn't be carrying somebody else's burden if they can carry it themselves. And Paul said, I carried my burden. I did not put it on you. I worked two jobs. I worked day and night. I did what I had to do so that I would not be a burden to you. And then I still had time, and I had a platform to preach the gospel of God to you. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, <clears throat> look, look at this. We talked about this in our, uh, our study last Sunday, but... Um, verses 11 and 12 he, back in 10 it, it starts off we urge you brethren that you increase more and more and that you aspire to lead a quiet life you know what's interesting that word quiet there is the same word Paul used in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 when he, and, um, and in, in writing to Timothy about the women in the church that they are quiet it, it doesn't Lead a quiet life doesn't mean we don't do anything. It means that we are at peace. Okay? That, that we're not creating turmoil and, and problems. And, and so he's saying, you guys, you lead a quiet life. You, you, you show stability and peace. You be an example of that. And you, you mind your own business. Now, we use that in a different way, don't we? Mind your own business. Stay out of my stuff. Okay, but mind your own business means take care of the things that you're responsible for. Take care of the things that you have in your house, the things that you need to be doing. Take care of those things. Mind your own business and work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, if you work with your head instead of your hands, that's okay. I mean, that's not... It's, it's, this is the way people learned, okay? Some of you can sit down and you can push a pencil and a, type on a computer and you can do great work. Th that's fine. That's work. That's labor. But here he says, work. Work with your hands. And he says it for this reason. Look at verse 12. That you may walk properly toward those who are outside. That's talking about people who are not believers in Christ. They're not of the family of God. So number one, he says, I want you to work hard, work honestly, be a good example, provide for your family, take care of your needs, mind your own business, work with your hands, so that you will be a testimony to those who are outside. When people look at the church, when they look at the believer in Christ, they should see 
hard-working, honest people who, who, who are taking care of their responsibilities. Okay, that's, we're not troublemakers. We're, we're taking care of business. And he says, and that you may lack nothing. Lack nothing. So when we do this, he said, you'll have what you need. Same principle, isn't it? All right. <clears throat> now, we don't have time to go through all of this one because it's time to wrap this up. But I encourage you to go home and read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And uh, Paul has, uh, he's really upset with some people in Thessalonica because, well, you know, the Lord's coming back any moment. Amen? Amen. Okay. And so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is quit my job and, and um, I might go preach on the corner a little bit or uh, I'll wait. But you know, when I get hungry because I'm not working anymore, I'm going to have to come over to your house and have supper with you. Is that okay? Paul says, no, it's not okay. The Lord's coming back and we don't know when. It's been uh, almost 2,000 years since these guys were thinking about it. But the Lord is coming back, by the way. But, but he says, be faithful until he's come. All right? Do, do your business. Take care of these things until and when the Lord comes back, fine. You know? But uh, it, it, here's an example of people who are just... Uh, well, I'm, I'm so spiritually minded, I don't work anymore. Can you feed me? And, there, and there's a passage in here that says, If a man does not work, he ought not eat. Wait, that's not very Christian, is it? Well, sure is Christian. It's right there in the Bible, okay? And uh, what is my greatest motivation to go to work? It's right there. And it's yours too, isn't it? It's amazing when you get really hungry what you'll do. Okay? So God says, work. Be a good example. And there's one more reason, and this is what we're closing with here. Let him who stole steal no more. That's it's not right. Christians ought not steal. Okay? You don't steal from other people who do work for you, do you? You pay them what they're worth. The work labor's worthy of his wages. And, uh, but... Labor. Let him labor, working with his hands what is good. This is instructions to each of us, believer. Now, what's the reason? The reason is that he, we, who work and receive wages, might have something to give to him who has need. This doesn't say we don't care about anybody who is in trouble. We do care about them. And we do help them. In fact, my wages should not just be for me. We know we give to the Lord. The Lord's work. We support missions. We do those things. But we give to the Lord in helping the poor. Okay, there are people who are working hard and they're not getting ahead. Okay, and we need to help. And if we work hard and we have enough, okay, to meet our needs and beyond, and that's what God blesses when we work hard, then we can help others. And, you know, God is saying, I want you to feel the joy that I feel because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so, work. Get out there. And um, it's not true that you deserve anything free of charge. You don't. Um, yeah, we should earn it. That's God's principle. If we can, we should. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving.